And welcome everybody to FSU Coach Live. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined today with a special guest, Jay Hernandez from the Charlotte Hornets. Jay, thanks so much for being here. I always, I always get terrified. I'm going to get the name wrong, or I'm going to get the organization wrong, and I'm going to, I'm going to mess it all up right at the beginning. But I think I got it right. Uh, right. If, if you wouldn't mind, just share a little bit about your experiences and how you got, you got into basketball and coaching and, and to where you are today. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. I know we've had a, a great uh, group of guests already, and uh, obviously uh, a big fan, close friend of Adrian Griffin, who's who's done a phenomenal job, and he's somebody I lean on. Um, you know, from my experiences, I have a, a broad background. Uh, I've always been involved in basketball from a very early age. Uh, my father uh, played 13 years professionally in Puerto Rico and was on the uh, the national team uh, the year that they qualified for the Olympics, but it was the boycott. Uh, so he didn't get to participate, but uh, I still have fond memories of watching him play. Uh, seven years old, watching him watching him play basketball in Puerto Rico and competing. Uh, you know, grew up playing multiple sports, but when I got to high school, I uh, really started to focus on basketball. Um, picked a school that was about an hour away drive, and um, you know, it was a great school. Uh, produced some phenomenal coaches and uh, players over the years. Uh, St. Dominic High School in Oyster Bay, Long Island. And uh, from there, I ended up getting a chance to go to University of New Hampshire for a year, I transferred back home to Long Island uh, to play for Jay Wright, uh, who's now, you know, a Hall of Famer and um, really fortunate to learn under him, you know, as, as one of his guards, his uh, point guard my senior year, played alongside other pros. And uh, during that process, I was also playing in Puerto Rico. And, uh, you know, because I transferred, I was able to get a dual MBA in marketing and management. And so my thought was, um, you know, that I'd go into the corporate world with, you know, the athletic background, the academic background, and hopefully, you know, with, with some of my other skill sets, uh, being able to communicate, hopefully sell and, and market, um, that I'd be able to grow, you know, through corporate world some way, somehow. And uh, when I finished up school, I ended up in admissions. I had a pretty fancy title, Director of Strategic Planning, and uh, I'm not sure what that was, <laughs> what I was doing there. But uh, it, was a, it afforded me an opportunity to, to get hit the ground running, make some money. And about eight or nine months in, a um, uh, former player from Hofstra University reached out to me and said that his wife was a manager in pharmaceutical sales. And I really didn't know anything about the industry. I didn't realize how difficult the uh, interview process was or how competitive it was. But I was able to, to land with a Johnson & Johnson company in pharmaceutical sales. I did that for two years um, while I was... Doing the pharmaceutical sales, I had already been started basketball training. And so I was uh, doing that since 1998. Um, my father was the first trainer at a place called Island Garden in West Hempstead, New York. And, um, you know, started training and working with players uh, back then that were under his tutelage. And I would just share some insight because I was still playing college basketball. And I fell in love with the process of helping people improve. And uh, so, you know, shortly thereafter, I just started getting some of my own kids, started working with them. And uh, at the time, there really wasn't a market for it. Um, there was a market for it. It's just, you know, there, was, there wasn't any other people for me to look at in, in the New York area to say, hey, I'm going to start this business in basketball training, and it's going to be something that is going to be my livelihood. Um, but fortunately, because of the stuff that I learned in school, uh, the passion I had for basketball, I was able to just do it on the side, you know, while still having a real job. And um, eventually that became – more of what I was doing than, than my real job. And so about two years in, I decided uh, to approach my wife about quitting pharmaceutical sales, which had a, a car, a gas card, you know, all the benefits and bonuses and, and regular salary to uh, go to Puerto Rico one more season, uh, play there, come back. And I had some camps and clinics already set up. And I gave myself about six months to make that work. And uh, I formulated a company called Pro Hoops. And uh, I did that for 10 years before I got the, uh, the call to join the Orlando Magic in the NBA. Mm. Very non-traditional way of becoming, a, you know, a professional coach. And I think right. it goes to show that there isn't one, one pathway in order to achieve what you've achieved. Going from, from, you know, having your own business and, and working privately with athletes into the NBA is, is not something that, that maybe you necessarily apply for. I suspect it relies a lot on who you've worked with, how they've developed, and also the networks that you've created during that process. 
Yeah, uh, again, coaching was something that I never sought out to do. Uh, I always thought that I would continue running my business. We had major sponsorship deals with companies like Muscle Milk and Under Armour. Uh, we had been on national commercials uh, with Kemba Walker, who was one of the players mm -hmm. that I had trained at that point in time and was able to reconnect with in the, at the NBA level, um, you know, and, you know, just I just love the process of helping players get better from – young girls and boys all the way to the pros and uh, we had it rolling we had pre-draft you know going and things like that and uh because of yeah because of some of the players that i had worked with and it was just consistent you know over the course of time that my name kept coming up and our program's name kept coming up and that the players that we were working with at the highest levels were improving and they happened to be young guys uh you know upstart type guys that ended up getting their opportunities and uh ended up becoming pretty good nba players uh the one player that 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 happened to to be was Tobias Harris, who I had trained for a while since he was in high school, and he got traded from Milwaukee mm -hmm. to Orlando. Um, there was already an assistant coach that had coached me in college that was already in Orlando as well. So when Tobias got there, he went from a guy that wasn't playing much in Milwaukee to his first couple of games averaging 20 uh, points a game. And uh, that summer, Jock Vaughn, who was the head coach there, uh, who's now the, the lead assistant or interim head coach for the Brooklyn Nets, um, asked – for Brett Gunning, who was the assistant that I knew, to go see what Tobias was doing in New York. You know, what kind of training was he getting? And so when he came back, he came, he said, hey, he's with Jay, he's in good hands, and, you know, we really like what he's doing. Uh, and it just so happened that there was a few years in a row where I had a number of lottery picks that came out of our program as well. And Orlando at that point in time was in the lottery those few years. And, uh, you know, they were looking at players and they kept asking, where are you guys working out? Well, we're in New York with Pro Hoops. Or we're working with a guy named Jay Hernandez. And so my name kept coming up. And to Jock's credit, um, you know, he said, hey, we have a young team here. These guys seem to really like what's going on out there. Uh, we've seen the improvement with a guy like Tobias. Um, you know, let's let's talk to him. So I really just had dinner with him. There was no job opportunity or anything like that. Just, you know, sat down and had dinner and we just communicated and talked. And obviously he was asking me some questions about if I would be intrigued in the NBA and why and why would I leave now, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I told him I missed the competitive aspect of, you know, uh, being with guys and having, you know, my my workouts mean something for a team and that mm -hmm. there were losses attached to it. And that's something that I didn't get from having my own private business. I was able to just see improvement from players and I cared about people. But I wasn't a part of, you know, specific wins and losses. So, uh, you know, I think he liked some of the things that I was talking about and we hit it off. And uh, the thing that, that helped me a lot was that he gave me a full summer to kind of take care of everything and, and be able to exit properly because I had six other people that were working with me that relied on me. I want to make sure that they were OK with the overhead and, you know, the uh, the clients that I was working with were all divvied up properly. And I finished out my camps and clinics. And, you know, at that point in time, I had to decide what I was going to do from a family perspective as well, because my wife was a tenured teacher in New York. Uh, my uh, my oldest was going to senior year. I uh, was looking at getting a scholarship to play Division One basketball and she was finishing up you know, her high school career with her teammates and good friends, you know, try to win a state title. So there was a lot of stuff that we were already thinking about and, uh, you know, wondering if it would be the right decision or not. I ultimately said yes, because I figured I would have that MBA on my resume, you know, unlike what, what you do. And, and obviously you, you have a doctorate degree. There's no doctorate degrees in, uh, you know, training or player development. And so I figured that'd be the best way. So if, if it didn't work out for me for a year or two, at least I had that on my resume and I can go back to my training business, um, you know, already coaching and training at the highest level. Mm. Well, if, if you are watching and, and have a question for Jay, put it in your chat box and we'll make sure that we, we get it to him. Now, if, if we go on your, your Twitter handle and we look, you've got a video there that talks a little bit or shows you what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you wouldn't mind, just kind of run through on a typical day, not in this environment, obviously, but, but in a typical day, what are your roles and responsibilities in, in working with the Hornets? Yeah, it usually starts off pretty early for me. I usually drop off my kids at school and you know head to the gym. I'm there by 7.30, 7.45. And at that point in time, I'm usually watching – uh, games and uh, breaking down film from either the previous game or breaking down film for the players that I'm working with. And, um, you know, that's a big part of what we do as coaches. We're constantly watching film and trying to identify, uh, you know, some, some bright spots and identify maybe some, some weaknesses or things that we can help our players with an individual basis or from a team basis. 
And, um, you know, we usually have a team meeting, uh, you know, coaching staff meeting, you know, right, right there at like nine o'clock in the morning. And then we'll start with our individual workouts. Uh, we call them vitamins. You know, we give our guys our daily dose of vitamins and we do that. <laughs> Uh, 20 minutes, uh, 20 minute increments, uh, you with whichever specific player you're with. Uh, in years past, I've had uh, four players. Um, you know, this year, I uh, ended up having three players that I worked with specifically. So I had three time slots that I was responsible for there. And then, um, you know, in the NBA, just it just depends on, you know, whether it's a game day, uh, a non-game day or an off day, you know, in terms of what you're doing. A typical practice day or uh, a non-game day would be this, and then we'd go into practice. Um, you know, sometimes we'll watch film before or during. Um, we'll have our practice. We guys will get shots after, and then you know, go back, have have some food, and then you're back to watching film again. You know, breaking stuff down. You know, sometimes you're watching uh, film with players specifically, and, and you know, doing some individual film sessions with them. And then um, you know, it just depends on what else you have going on. For me, being a director of player development as well. Uh, I'm breaking down things that can help out our whole team uh, from the stuff that we're doing. Uh, evaluations, I think, are very, very important that are usually uh, not used enough at the NBA level. So I like to evaluate uh, where our players are in 10-game 10, 10 increments, um, you know, where they are quarterly, and uh, be able to have some subjective and objective um, grades, basically, to, to be able to look at and say, hey, here's some areas where – we can we can improve, and uh, here are some areas that you've been phenomenal, and and give some comparisons to other players across the league, and say you're a starting point guard in the NBA. Here's your comparison to other starting point guards in the NBA where you rank. Uh, so that way, you know, there's no uh, no arguing at that point in time. It's just pretty clear cut and dry. And and then from there, from a player development perspective, as a staff, we can decide what's going to be the proper course of action to help this guy get better in certain areas and um, I think that's really really important so yeah the day for me again it's I think you'll, you'll talk to most coaches it's it's a game day situation non-game day game days are usually a lot more uh, hectic yeah because you're you're there early sometimes you have shoot arounds um, you know again if it's your scout you're working on that me specifically uh, my role this year uh, was offensive scouting reports I've done defensive scouting reports uh, for years um, you know, under Frank Vogel, uh, who's with the Lakers now, and I learned a lot about defensive scouting, you know, through him and, and, and how in-depth it was. And then now I'm doing more on the offensive side, which has been interesting because uh, now I'm seeing the game more from a perspective of how do I get our guys better within the flow of our offense? Um, you know, how, how are we going to compete against other teams and what are they doing defensively that's unique that might present some challenges? And, um, and I also am responsible for all the ATOs or after timeout plays. So, um, you know, I'll meet with coach in the morning and we'll go over that on that day, specifically what are some things that I've seen other teams have some success with uh, against them? What, what are some plays um, or some matchups that we might be able to uh, utilize against a specific team if they like to switch a lot or if they're running zones? And, um, you know, throughout the game, I'll be giving my input as to what I see or how they've switched their defense throughout the throughout the flow of the game. So it's been really cool to be a part of that, be able to get out there during the game and give some suggestions and, and sometimes see it work. And, you know, other times I also know when not to impart any, any, uh, any knowledge or talk at all, you know, when the coach is in a certain uh, mode or, you know, he's, he's thinking about something more on the defensive end just to leave him alone and, you know, approach him at another time. So uh, it's been really, really good from that perspective. Well, we're, we're getting some questions in, but I want to, to go back to where you said you worked with specific players. Yeah. What specifically do you work with them on? Is it technique? Is it strategy or, or something else? Yeah, it's, it's uh, the, a lot of it is the technical skills when you have them on the court and you're working on uh, specific things, whether it's uh, shooting, um, making reads off of pick and rolls, um, you know, ball handling techniques, passing, uh, defensive concepts. And then, you know, the film breakdown is usually – uh, from them in the game that they played in and some of the things that maybe as a team uh, conceptually we were trying to do uh, in a five-man defensive uh, shell as we call it at the NBA level um, were they in the right spot you know how did they recover uh, what areas did I see that they really look good you know a lot of it is also accentuating the positives and I think uh, I think the one thing that's missed a lot is that uh, accountability and positivity you know have to be two separate entities and I I think it, they have to be married, especially with today's athlete. Um, you have to be able to 
hold players accountable, but you know, the, the way you approach them and the wording you have, you know, can still be positive and uh, you know, you can still use certain words and verbiage to, to help get your message across uh, without them shutting down. And so uh, that, that's real important to have that, you know, that, that open dialogue with those guys and also collaborate and say, what are you seeing? You're the one playing the game. You know, why didn't you get to this spot or were you focused on something else or did you not hear the call? You know, so there, there are things there as well that I don't I see things on film, but maybe they're feeling it differently in the game. And, you know, that can help me address some issues as well that maybe we can help them uh, with the way we're approaching our practices or, you know, as, as a coach, we can we can adjust some things. So um, I think that's that's a perspective that I think a lot of people miss out on. Um, so it's it's a lot of it. It's it's it becomes counseling. You're talking to guys, especially when they're they're struggling with things. Um, you know, you have to know how to talk to them and how to reach them. And I think that's where, uh, with coaching, you can talk about relating to players. But I also think it's very important uh, as a I think a deeper level is connecting. I think we all relate to players based on basketball. Uh, you know, no matter if I'm 80 years old and kids that keep coming in are 20 years old, we're going to relate on basketball. We're going to relate on competing and relate on hopefully improving. You know, helping them get better. Uh, the connection, the connection piece is is a little bit deeper for me, where you understand, you know, who's around them, who are they training with, uh, what family members uh, are, are they closest to, are they listen to, how they grow up, you know, if they have kids, uh, know their names, you know, things like that, and I think that that helps you uh, develop an even deeper deeper relationship. It, yeah, it's a good it's it's a good point. Kind of stole some of my questions. NBA coach Griffin, Adrian Griffin, he's watching on, who is also a guest on this show. Says, yeah. what are some specific things that you do to connect with your players? You get to know them. How do you get to know them? Do you have events? Do you do activities? Yeah. Uh, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, again, I like to know what they're what they're into. Um, you know, I'd like to go out to eat with these guys, especially when we're on we're on the road. Uh, take them to a restaurant and be able to sit down and talk to them and, and just see, you know, uh, just have a conversation. I think that's one of the best ways to get to know them. I think when they're not with us in the off season and, and they get to go home for a few weeks, uh, be able to travel to see them for a few days, you know, where they're from. So if they're working out with a specific player development coach, being able to visit them, uh, you know, where they are, eat at their favorite restaurant, um, hang out with their people. And it's a good way, you know, to know who are they really listening to on a day in and day out basis, because if you can make that person an ally, you know, it helps you connect on a deeper level and it, it helps your message be uh, brought across on a, on a broader scale as well. Um, you know, so I've, I've, you know, done it all. I've, I've gone to movies with guys, um, gone bowling and, you know, uh, this year I tried, I was going to try to go fishing, but it didn't work out, you know, and I think a lot of that stuff is important. I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've had guys in the past that, again, everybody learns differently. And some guys have a hard time just sitting in a film session for more than 15, 20 minutes, but they can go fishing for four hours. And mm -hmm. so what, what does that mean? You know, what is that level of engagement that they have for fishing that I wouldn't personally have? Um, and how do I use some of the terminology that they use in fishing, maybe for basketball to try to get them engaged in the process. And so uh, I think a lot of that stuff ends up helping us connect and coach better when we know, you know, some of the other things that they're into. And, and it surprises you a lot of times that, you know, guys uh, at this level, you know, they need that release and they do so many different cool things. And, uh, sometimes it, it allows me to, uh, reach out and, and get out of my comfort zone as well. So it's been pretty cool to help me expand as a person. Yeah, you made a really good point that I want to emphasize, which is understanding their background and be able to let, relate their interests into how you actually provide the coaching. And it provides that connectability so that they understand in their world what you're trying to get across. Yeah. Uh, another another question came in a little a little different. Hold on, let me get it up here. And uh, it says, Coach J. Do you see the NBA adding a four-point line considering that a lot of players are heaving longer shots, although I wouldn't be a fan of it? I don't, I don't, I don't see it going there right now. I think there's been some cool articles written about changes. Um, but, uh, you know, the cool thing about the G League is that they actually try certain things there to see if it works a year in mm -hmm. advance before we even establish it at the NBA level. So I don't think we're – there yet um, or close to it yet until they start discussing that being something that they introduce at the G league level. Um, but I'm not one of these guys that's adverse to change. I think uh, at one point in time, they told players they couldn't dunk and uh, you know, the lane changed, the three point line came in and that was controversial at the first place. And people probably couldn't think of a game without the three point line in today's time. 
Um, so, you know, all the basketball purists, uh, you know, it's funny to me because there's been so many changes over the, over the history of the game that, um, you know, nowadays we just take for granted. So uh, I'm always open to, to hearing and seeing what suggestions there are out there to make the game better. And I think uh, our commission is doing a great job of, of trying to figure out ways to do that. And you saw that with the All-Star game this year. I thought we did a great job in the All-Star game making that more competitive. And, um, you know, I think the, the fans really enjoyed that as well. Going back to your coaching, one of the, the big challenges that you have is how many games you have to play. And, you know, obviously half of them are on the road. And so you do a lot of traveling. How do you juggle the the balance of being a, a family man and, and spending time at home versus the fact that your days are long and when you're traveling, you're often traveling for many days at a time? Yeah, it's it's very difficult, and it, it took me uh, took me a while to figure that out, um, you know, and how to be more engaged when I'm home. I think that's one of the biggest things because mm -hmm. I think balance is a word that's used, but it's not realistic uh, for, you know, the, the right. season that we have. So I think your level of engagement when you're home, uh, being present uh, is really important. So if I have work to do, I, I still try to get it done. Uh, but after everybody goes to sleep, you know, that, that might mean that I have to stay up till 3 a.m. to get something done. But that means that I gave at least two or three quality hours to my family. And I think that that's huge. Early on in my career, I was bringing the work home with me and, you know, I'd have a quick dinner. I'd say, hey, guys, you know, love you. And I would just try to get back to work again. Mm -hmm. I wasn't uh, being a very good husband or a father at that point in time. So I think it's very important to understand that. I think for us, we've done some cool things where um, at least once a year, we try to have a family trip on the road so that the family can connect and we can experience something where we know we're going to be in the city maybe for two or three days and, mm -hmm. um, you know, get out of the room for a little bit and engage in that. Uh, my wife will take at least a few trips a year so that we can spend some time and, um, you know, she can get out of the house and, and out of the, the rut of working and doing everything that she does uh, so well at home. And then, um, you know, we'll watch shows, you know, like there'll be certain nights um, that we'll watch a, a family show and we'll watch it together, you know, whether I'm on FaceTime or we'll connect and be like, oh, I can't believe that happened. So we try to do things and connect in those kinds of ways. Luckily, nowadays we have FaceTime and right. you know, that nature, which which makes it a little bit easier that, that maybe wasn't as accessible years years past. Um, but I think, you know, trying to find ways to get creative with that stuff and, and incorporate the family more um, in what I'm doing and what who I am, what I'm about when I'm with the team, I think it's been pretty cool. So, you know, all the players know my kids and they, they know their names and they, they become, you know, part of the the bigger collective group. And I think, you know, being a part of coaching staffs that understand that and uh, welcome that, you know, helps you do your job even better. And a lot of people might might see Jay Hernandez, NBA coach, and just maybe, maybe put you on a pedestal of, you know, you've made it, everything's great, life is good, yeah. get well paid, et cetera, et cetera. But but I know that that every coach has their challenges, and I'm curious, what kind of challenges do you face in, beyond you know the, the the schedule that you have and the time that it takes that that Coach Hernandez faces on a daily basis that that people should know about if they're interested in following this profession? Yeah, I, I, the first big challenge for me when I entered the NBA was um, I took a big pay cut. Uh, so, really? yeah. Uh, so coming from the private sector, uh, into the NBA, I took a bit, big pay cut in order to hopefully reach my goal now be, becoming a head coach at some point in time. Um, and you know, I had to get started. I knew if I didn't take that, that shot at that point in time, that, uh, my window was probably going to close. Um, and I fig I figured in the private sector, you know, the way I was, uh, how active I was and, and the way I was going about my business it was probably going to be a glass ceiling for me. I was, I was really working some crazy, crazy hours. Um, you know, I was, people don't realize I was doing 12 hours a day uh, consistently uh, for four or five days straight with no lunch or dinner breaks. Um, wow. you know, and that was, you know, over the course of the summer and pre-draft and things. So that would be like almost a six month window like that. Uh, but yeah, when I came into the league, um, there were a bunch of challenges. Uh, my family, again, they stayed home for that first year. Um, coaching staff got fired 52 games in. Uh, I was able to last the last 30 games under uh, James Borrego, who I'm working for now as the interim coach. Um, got to meet Igor Kokoskov, who has been an NBA uh, head coach, um, you know, and, you know, worked with some great guys. So I finished out that last 30 games thinking, hey, we might not even last past All-Star break here because we are uh, kind of a 
the skeleton crew, they got rid of uh, other assistant coaches and our head video coordinator who are all outstanding coaches. And we lasted, you know, the rest of that year. Um, and then at that point in time, I had still I only had one year left on my contract. So, you know, I think it's really the uncertainty sometimes of the NBA. And I, I got thrown into the fire pretty quickly. Uh, that next year, Scott Skiles came in um, along with, with Adrian Griffin. And, um, you know, fortunately, I had one more year to prove myself and um, let them know you know, what I was about and, and just show really what I was about. And uh, my family hadn't moved at that point in time yet because I only had the one year on my contract. So we wanted to make sure that I felt comfortable that Scott Skiles, you know, I felt like he was going to retain me. And uh, within a few months, he had paid me, you know, one or two compliments. And just off of those one or two compliments, because he's a truth teller uh, uh, and he doesn't just give away compliments. So when he did that, I figured, hey, I, I think I'm going to be here for the long haul. Uh, let's try to get the family here. I don't want to do another year without you guys. So my family ended up moving um, in December, late December of that year. And at that point in time, um, my wife ended up leaving a tenured job in, in New York when people mm -hmm. realize how much money they make in New York to, as a tenured teacher and, and, you know, the work that she put in to get to that point. So we lost her salary at that point. I was still under my salary that I was making when I had my own private business and uh, we lost money on my house. So now I was living day to day, um, but you know, like my, I was just waiting on the next paycheck and, you know, doing everything I could to make that money last. And so I was struggling financially uh, just to make things work. And, you know, for the people that don't know that, I think hopefully that, you know, is something that they could look at and say, hey, he still had a great attitude and, and did his work and didn't let anything affect that. And uh, I really was cognizant of not letting that happen. I really wanted to, with the belief that I had, the belief that my family had in me to move and do that, um, you know, we were all in. And so uh, at the end of that year, uh, Coach Giles decided that he didn't want to coach anymore. And so he gave up millions of dollars and uh, decided that's it. And mm -hmm. Frank Vogel came in. And uh, my first conversation with him was in regards to if I, if he said to me, if I were you, I'd be looking. I've heard great things about you. <laughs> Uh, but if I were you, you know, that's usually the, the telltale sign, like your time right. is coming to an end. And uh, my family had just moved. My wife just gave up her job. Uh, I was really scared. And, uh, you know, I knew that there was going to be no money coming in as of July 1st. So I was doing my, my best to see what else was out there. Um, I continue to do my job every day, work with players, uh, you know, break down film, do pre-draft workouts and just be just be present. Again, it keeps coming back to being present. Uh, I knew I had a job to do. And, you know, until I stopped getting paid for that job, I was going to do it at the, the best of my ability. And he ended up, you know, seeing that over and over again. He ended up reaching out to Jay Wright, who was my college coach. And uh, Jay Wright gave him an opportunity when he got fired uh, a long time ago from uh, Philadelphia as a scout to come and work with some of the guys at Villanova. And, and Jay told him, if, if you bring him back, I promise you he'll he'll be loyal. He'll work hard. He'll, he's a great guy. And, um, you know, I was fortunate they, they gave me, you know, two years to be a part of that. So a lot of the NBA is just the ability to adapt and overcome uh, each coaching um, staff and, and coach uh, themselves that have a different style and trying to figure out how to adapt and how to adjust to, you know, the workflow and uh, still maintain who you are as a person and be authentic to who you are. And I think that's what's helped me over the course of this time is, uh, stayed very consistent, very authentic to the process. And, um, you know, luckily I was able to stick with a lot of different coaching staffs and that helped me build my network throughout the NBA. And so at that point in time, I didn't re really didn't know um, where it was going and I had to keep starting over every year. And that was the hard part. I, was, I felt like I, by the end of the year, I showed that I could do more than what my title showed. Mm -hmm. I had to go back to square one. So I, I kept saying, how, do, how am I going to grow within this? And eventually, by year four, I was able to get to the bench with uh, with Frank Vogel and, and learn a lot and be around some great people. And, you know, it's just it's just what it is. It's it's one of those things that in the NBA, it's just you live in uncertainty a lot of times, um, even when you're doing a good job. Um, you know, within a year or two, you can be moving on. I think within all, all of the sports, the NBA has the worst track record of um uh, years for coaches uh, in one place. So, uh, you know, knowing that that's the hardest part on myself and my family, usually that we know that we're going to have to be somewhere else once we get comfortable. Well, there is a lot of pressure in the NBA and, and you've just kind of highlighted some of that and some of the challenges of transitions and things. What do you do to, to kind of relieve that stress and, and avoid the burnout that happens so often in coaching? Yeah, uh, for me, it's just, uh, 
it's a combination of things. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm big on prayer. I feel like, uh, you know, I leave uh, things in God's hands and I realize that a lot of things are out of my control. And uh, I think that's important to, to have that outlet. Um, you know, again, I rely on my wife a lot. She, she's she's our, the rock of our family. So just to have somebody close to be able to put things in perspective, to, uh, to be there, to believe in me when I have doubt in myself is huge. Um, you know, I can remember, you know, going through some, some really bad losing streaks and as a coach, you know, it feels like the world is falling down on you, but you realize what's happening in the real world and you, you put it in perspective pretty quickly, but it was, it was a season where we had two multiple 10, 10 loss, uh, streaks going on. And it's not something that you really want to be a part of. And, um, you know, I came home to a, a board that said a, uh, you know, a bad day on the court is better than a good day on the street. And, uh, you know, I was sitting, you know, at 3 a.m. I'm reading this as I'm going up my stairs. It was there already made for me. Um, and it was really cool, you know, to have that, to put everything into a perspective of appreciation, you know, for what you have and you continue to fight for everything. Because I think what happens is uh, if you have appreciation, um, it puts everything in perspective. And I think there's even on our worst days, there's people, uh, there's thousands of coaches out there that would trade uh, yeah. to be with me right you know, through lose weeks, uh, become in the NBA. And so, uh, you know, when you start to think about that kind of stuff, uh, you know, it, it puts perspective and it gives you that motivation, to continue to do what you've been doing at a high level. And you and you take it out of context where it's just about you and you focus it back on the team, you focus it back on the players that you're working with, these young guys that you're trying to help on the court and off the court. Uh, it makes everything much more worthwhile. You know, it's, it's bigger than you. So, you know, when it gets to those scenarios, I remember the people that I'm working with and, and why why I started in the first place, and uh, I'm ready to get going again. You you mentioned kind of aspirations of, of one day being a head coach. I'm, I'm curious, what what steps are you taking in order for you to to be ready for when that call comes? Yeah, for me, it's a, a lot of it is, is talking to other coaches, um, you know, especially around this time where, where we're home. Uh, mm -hmm. I ran a lot of um, Instagram live, um, you know, kind of chats with coaches from all areas, uh, you know, all across the NBA, from the G League, uh, guys that were former head coaches, uh, current college head coaches. So uh, on the men's and women's side. So uh, to me, learning like we're doing right now, learning the journey and the pathway of some of these incredible people is has been very inspiring um you get to realize that a lot of it comes down to what you believe in and the principles that you stand for and the consistency in your approach um you know being being there um and being ready is huge so for me it's, it's learning the different steps um you know for me i'm always trying to master my level uh, to either expand that box uh, to be able to do more or take the next step to the next level and uh, i think a lot of people try to skip steps uh, so I'm not trying to skip steps. I'm always trying to improve. I'm always learning. And, uh, you know, for me, um, I, I feel like as a head coach, um, it's a lot like running my own business, you know, because you're accountable for everything. And uh, accountability means ownership. You know, there's your your assistants are responsible for things, you know. And so uh, me as an assistant, I'm responsible for my ATOs. And if I give coach a, an ATO that I'm adamant about and it, it, it flops completely, well, he's the one that's eventually accountable for making the call on that. So I feel like by having my own business for all those years and creating culture standards and expectations, I think that's already set the foundation for me for hopefully head coaching down the line. Um, but I don't know if anybody's truly ready to be a head coach. I think you have to actually sit right. in that seat. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a part of as much coaching as I can, as much leadership uh, conferences, uh, reading books, um, you know, like I said, engaging in, in those things hopefully will help me. And I think it's, it's more than the X's and O's. I think it's being able to talk to people that are sports psychologists, um, being able to talk to people that are great at sales and marketing. You know, I think there's avenues in different uh, areas that we can incorporate as coaches that will help you become a better head coach, uh, you know, when you get there, because I think a lot of uh, great assistants won't make great head coaches. You know, they, they're used to that daily grind. It's kind of like a, a chef that can, that can cook the best meals, but can't run the business. And so I think understanding, you know, the business of basketball, understanding how to manage players and manage, um, you know, management and, and be able to collaborate with them. I think all those facets are huge. And uh, I think it's more about the person than it is um, what you know as a basketball coach and what you know about the on-court stuff. Uh, so I think you have to marry those things. 
Last question then, if you are working with somebody who wants to become a coach or wants to move up as a coach, what kind of suggestions would you give to them that maybe you didn't make those those good decisions early on and you had to learn the hard way? What should they know now the, so that they can make sure they do it right the first time? Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of different people that I could talk to in this regard. Obviously, I'm going to go back to player development guys. Uh, that was my background. Um, one is if you're working with high level players and, and they happen to be in the NBA, one thing I didn't do is I, I never reached out to the NBA assistant that they had been working with or, or the head coach in general to see um, what they saw on the player and what areas that they felt as a staff that player needed to do to improve uh, for the team and, and how they can basically get more playing time you know, under that system. Uh, so I think that's something that players should do. They should engage and it be at the college ranks as well, uh, you know, where, you know, one of your top players working with a specific assistant, you know, try to figure out, you know, what what they're doing. Can you get any of the drills that they work on? You know, or maybe you'll add some variations to it or, you know, get a hold of the playbook. Uh, terminology is big in the NBA. So uh, one thing that I struggled with early was the terminology and the schemes that, you know, we had in Orlando because I entered a staff that had already been in place for two years and, um, you know, they had already established their own schemes and, and things that they did. So I was lost. And so my, my biggest thing was how do I ask an engaging question, not have an answer to something, but, you know, basically give to this group by asking a good question that gets everybody thinking. And uh, I think that's important for young, young people is uh, asking good questions is as important as having all the answers. And, um, you know, for me uh, now, you know, people ask all the time, how do I get involved with the NBA? I think you have to be at summer league. You have to be out there engaging and, and being present and, and being at the different events that they host. Anytime you can be at an NBA event that you can get access to, you know, definitely take advantage of it. Um, a lot of the coaches are really good to talk to. They'll give you some time, you know, and uh, I think uh, finding that balance of, you know, being able to communicate with them and, you know, see if you can get some information or, or engage with them and through social media now is, is really big. It was something that a lot of people didn't have, you know, access to years ago and it's blown up and more and more coaches are utilizing it. Not so much to promote themselves. I don't think at the NBA level, it's more about how they're engaging with their players. So I think it's another way for us to connect with our players and let them see that, hey, we've got lives and we're right. You know, human and we understand how to use some of these tools as well so um you know i think it's just you know kind of seeing what the trends are knowing what those are um seeing where events are being held and then also just continuing to you know grow within your network and having real relationships i think is is key you know i think some people again they you can sense once they get something from you that you don't hear from them again um you know, you're not going to be able to go back to that well again. And I think it's very, very important for people to have uh, real lasting relationships with people that they can confide in, talk to and learn from. And, and speaking of which, if somebody does want to reach out to you and has a question, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, they can they can reach me uh, via Twitter uh, at Coach J.H. Uh, would be great. Um, I'm on there pretty consistently, you know, watching and, and, and seeing what everybody's doing. So that, that'd be a good avenue. Um, Instagram I, I'm at Coach J Hernandez on Instagram. So uh, sometimes the DMs are a little bit easier there uh, to get in contact with me. And I try to be uh, pretty regular, you know, especially around this time of year during the season. It's very difficult because we're we're at, you know, operating uh, at, at a high level and, and consistently. But uh, you know, definitely, I you know, look forward to hearing more from from the people that were on here. Well, I do want to say thank you so much for joining us today and, and sharing your wisdom and experience. Very much appreciate it. I appreciate you as well. Thank you for putting this together. And I look forward to, to seeing the future guests as well on this. Of course. And speaking of future guests, nice segue. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, Cheryl Kirk is joining us from USA Racquetball. She's the national team leader for the sport. She'll be talking about what she does when teams go and compete internationally. And then coming up on Friday, Sergio Scariolo from the Toronto Raptors and also the Spanish national team head coach, will be joining us to share his experiences and not to mention all of the guests we've got lined up next week. But on behalf of myself, Tim Baggers, uh, Jay Hernandez, thanks so much for watching. Thank you.